When commenting the uh, changes at the legislative level, the Court of Justice is quite clear by saying, dear stakeholders, please consider that the reality by constitutional viewpoint is changed. We cannot consider that for the big data world, um, a self-management system uh, only based on notice and choice could, uh, could, could work. It has to be complemented by an ethical dimension. We, our platform, it used to take you 45 minutes to build your profiles and do everything else until we added uh, the social networks, so Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. What it means is anything that happens to them has a knock-on effect on us. If you regulate it, what, you're gonna, what you can potentially do is squash the innovation. This is not our data. This is the customer data. And then it should be the customer's decision to, to decide how they want to treat the data. And most of us, when you open an application, we don't know what kind of permissions we are giving in terms of get extracting for our data. And I think that just creating some kind of, uh, of mechanism you know, that can allow our customers uh, to make very transparent to them every moment what are the data that are being transferred to a determined server part. That could be location, that could be payment, that could be agenda. So just giving in information, I think it will be very useful to people. I would like to have uh, information about my data that allows me to have the freedom to manage it then in the same way that I manage my money. 20, 25 years ago, it may have been, it made sense to ask people for their consent in the relatively small number of cases where data was being kind of given, like I was giving you my data, like going to see the doctor, you know, you consent, it's a, it's a high touch transaction. Um, today, every time you go to a website, there's something happening. And you have to ask the question, is consent is the cons do we want to be consenting 10,000 times a day? And if you are consenting 10,000 times a day, is it meaningful to you? Are you really exercising control? And that's because we're kind of, there's a sort of a sense that that's the only way to go forward, and I think it's the wrong way. Many of uh, those people traveling somewhere in the European Union, they would like to get uh, access uh, to their legally bought uh, digital uh, content, uh, e-books, audio books, uh, uh, music, uh, movies uh, in some other countries. Because, but because of copyright restrictions, they cannot. We would like to, to allow portability of the content. And uh, we will deal with the cross-border access uh, to digital content uh, uh, next year. And, and then we will deal also with the piracy issues. In the European Union, we have more content production than the US. So, so we are a very rich continent in that area. And we shouldn't destroy it, especially because we have a lot of uh, languages a uh, lot of uh, cultural traditions in small areas. And by this uh, um, market pressure to get rid of the barriers, the smaller will disappear first. Um, so um, I am from Germany, so I think uh, Germany will have some leeway still, but the smaller countries will feel the pressure sooner. And I'm not sure that they are happy. Um, and therefore, we have to make sure that also, let's say, some local, some regional, some traditional content will not, not just disappear because of the disappearance of market uh, barriers. I cannot understand those people who say that, uh, that to touch our existing copyright legislation, it works. How uh, we can say it works when we know that uh, even 20% of internet users in the European Union are using VPN to get access uh, to digital content, or 68% of film viewers in the European Union say they are using so-called free downloads. How it works? When we will be ready to say that, that, that we have to change our legislation? All right, so please thank me. Help me thank, uh, thank me in with my uh, panelists.